Hey guys, I'm Andrew. And I'm John. And uh, today we're going to be talking about one-dimensional kinematics for the Yukon Q Center. Um, so first we're going to explain to you uh, some basics of kinematics. John is going to, and then I'm going to run through a problem with you guys. So take it away, John. All right, thank you, Andrew. Let's get started. So a pretty natural place to start is from Newton's second law of motion, which essentially says that if you have some object, let's go ahead and label it by this block with mass m, and you apply a whole bunch of forces on it in whatever direction you like, keep in mind that force is a vector so it can have a magnitude and a direction, then if I take the sum of all these forces, oops, if I take the sum of all the forces, otherwise known as the net force, as I've written this equation here, then I can actually find out the acceleration a of the object. So in the problem that we're about to do for one dimensional kinematics, we're actually going to use a constant gravitational field. In general, this 1D kinematics formula will work for any problem that has a constant acceleration. But let's look a little bit more into exactly what's going on for our problem in question. So if I go ahead and define a coordinate system, x and y, I can label at any point in space the gravitational field, which has, which we label by g, and everywhere it's a constant force, or I should say a constant acceleration, and the force due to gravity is given by the mass of the object times g. Now if you notice, the coordinate system I chose has y going up in the vertical direction and x going along the horizontal. So if I want to write this in terms of this coordinate space, then I can rewrite this g with its magnitude, which is about 9.8, 1 meters per second squared. And I can also throw in the direction, which is the minus y hat direction. And if I throw both of these things together, I get this equation right here, which tells us the force due to the gravitational acceleration on an object with mass m. OK, so why is this useful? Well, if you take a look at this equation right here, f equals ma, we have the acceleration in there. And the acceleration is related to the velocity of the object and also to the position of the object. So we can use calculus to integrate and find the velocity and position of the object at any time that we'd like, as long as the force continues to be a constant acceleration force in the context of the one-dimensional kinematics problem. OK, so if we go ahead and use the calculus, what, is this, what are the solutions going to look like? Well, here they are. Let me go ahead and display them. As you notice, the variables in question are the velocity, time, acceleration, and delta x stands for change in position. You might also notice that there are some subscripts on the velocities, the 0 standing for initial velocity, and the f standing for final velocity. So when you're working with these one-dimensional kinematics problems and you're given various pieces of information, you need to decide which equation or equations would be useful in actually solving for the variable that you're looking for at the end of the problem. And another note, even though it's not important for this particular problem, is to be sure to break into x and y components. Sometimes your forces, and therefore your velocities and changes in positions, may not be in all the x direction or all the y direction. Maybe sometimes your velocity may be moving like this, or a force is pushing somewhere that's not in the x or y direction. So since they're vectors, you need to make sure that you break into components, and then you can use these equations in each of the component directions. OK, so now Andrew's going to take it away, and he's going to do a particular problem that invokes the 1D kinematics equations. Cool. Thank you very much, John. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the problem. So the problem here is that you're standing in a window that's 10 meters off the ground. Then you see a ball come up past the windowsill, and it's going straight upward. So no moving in any other direction other than straight up and down. So you, you decide that you're going to time the ball from the moment it goes past the window sill until it goes up out of view and comes back down and falls out of view below the window sill. And you're going to keep your at a very, very accurate time on your stopwatch. And when you do this, you find that the ball took eight seconds to go up and down past the window sill. And what we want to know is how high off the ground the ball went. So the first thing that we like to do when we're trying to understand physics problems is draw a picture. And so I've done that here for you. Um, note that I've drawn it, it looks like it's going in two dimensions, that's going up and also moving away from the window, but I just wanted to separate the upwards and downwards motion. This is only going straight up and straight down. So you have the ball as it comes past the windowsill initially, hits the top of its 
arc and then comes back downwards. Not actually an arc, but straight 1D kinematics. So we have our Y0 here. So Y0 is our initial height off the ground, and we were told that we were initially 10 meters off the ground. That's where my window is. We want to know Y max here. We don't know it. We want to know it. Um, and the time it takes the ball to make this complete transition from this, from this ball to this ball is 8 seconds. So I'm just going to mark a couple of extra things on here that are going to be useful for the problem. So this is going to be velocity initial. So this is the velocity of the ball and it's going upwards. And then we have the final velocity of the ball here going downwards. And we also have the velocity here at the top which I'll call V-top. We also have one other piece of information that we need, uh, or that would be useful. So if we know Y0 and we know Y max, the only thing we need to know is the difference between the two so that we can add, eight, the bit, so that we can add this difference to Y0 and get Y max. So the difference between here and the top here, we're going to call H. And if we solve that, we add on Y0, we get Y max. So the first thing you have to do is pick one of the kinematics equations to use. Um, in a lot of cases, you're not only going to use one, but you're going to use multiple of them to solve it. So the first one that I'm going to pick is I'm going to pick VF equals V0 plus acceleration times time. Oh, that's, you can't see that. Hold on one second. <laughs> so it's VF equals V0 plus acceleration times time. Sorry about that. So it may not be obvious why I picked that right now, but when you solve it, you'll see why. Uh, a lot of times, picking the right equation just comes with practice. So here, I, know, I don't know what V0 and what VF are, but I know that the total time to go from V0 to VF is going to be um, 8 seconds. So we have our capital T here. And I know that the acceleration is a constant gravitational uh, acceleration downwards um, because we're doing this in a gravitational field. I also don't know anything about V0 and VF. So usually two unknowns, we don't know. We, th this equation would not be very useful. But in this case, we know one other piece of information about V0 and VF. We know that V0 is going to equal to negative VF or vice versa. Um, the reason being that as you throw something up in the air and catch it, the speed at which it leaves your hand is going to be, up, is going, to be exactly the same, give or take, uh, the, uh, the velocity as when it enters your hand. So I can use this, I can exploit this fact here and write this just in terms of V0. So I can write this as negative V0 equals V0 minus gt, and then I can solve this for v0. So I'm going to do that very quickly. So I'm going to get this guy, and then if I solve for v0, I get that v0 is equal to gt over 2. So again, it might not be obvious why we need v0, but if you, look at, if you look at the second equation I'm going to pick, it will become obvious why we need it. So now I'm going to try to find how far it goes from the bottom of the windowsill to the top of its arc. And so in order to do that, I need to analyze half of this transition. So it spends equal time going up as it does going down. So it takes eight seconds to rise. Uh, eight seconds to go rise and fall, so four seconds to just rise. So here, the other equation that I'm going to be using is the one that's Vf squared equals V initial squared plus 2 acceleration times your change in x, or your change in, your change in position. So when I say x, I don't mean the x direction. Uh, x is just a general term in this equation for your position in the xy plane. So. Uh, like I said, I'm only going to be analyzing half of the motion of this ball because I only care about the rise time uh, and the rise height. The fall time and the fall distance will be exactly the same, and I just want to find h. So I know that the final for half of this problem is the velocity at the top. 
but we know something special about the velocity at the top of a parabolic arc. In the y direction, the velocity up and down uh, at the top of the arc is going to be zero. For the briefest of seconds, at the top of uh, throwing something, and when it's at, at as high as it can, it's at its apex, uh, the velocity in the y direction is zero. So we can fill that in very quickly. Zero squared is zero. Uh, we also have v0 here in terms of things we know. So we can fill that in as well. When you square everything, you just, when you square a combination, you just square everything. So I get g squared, t squared over 2 squared or 4. We also know that the acceleration here is negative g. So I'm going to end up with minus 2g. And then the change in position here is actually just the height we're looking for. So I plug in height here. So now if you see here, we know everything in this expression except for h. So we can solve for that. And so if we do that very quickly, we get 2gh is equal to g squared t squared over 4 by simply adding that over. And cancel one of the g's and divide the 2 over. So we get that the height is equal to g t squared over 8. And so this is actually uh, not our final answer. So if you plug this in on, say, an assignment or you give this as an answer to this question, this is wrong. Um, what we're actually looking for, remember, is the maximum height off the ground. And we said that y max is simply h plus y0. So you can see that here. We have y0 here and h, and that ends up being the same height as y max. So that was how we defined it. And it also works out mathematically. So if you notice that this whole time in this problem, I did it with solely variables. Even though I was given numbers, I didn't plug them in. And the reason being is that it's better for finding an analytical solution. So you can see that you get an h here. And it tells you exactly in terms of physical quantities what h is and tells you more about the physics. Also, it helps to circumvent rounding errors. So if you're continuously plugging in numbers and you're rounding and stuff like that, as you do more and more operations, your error gets bigger and bigger because you're multiplying by things and any little bit of error is going to get multiplied and so on. So it's easier just to plug in at the end and get your answer. So if you plug in here at the end, what you'll find is that g is about 10. Uh, t, g, we use that approximation that g is about 10 when we don't have a calculator. Obviously, I do not at the moment. Um, t is 8. So you plug that number in and you get 8 squared divided by 8 is 8 times 10. So this is about 80 meters. And we know that for our final value here, h is 80. And we know that our initial height was 10. So the value that we were looking for at the end was 90 meters high off the ground. So y max is 90 meters. And that is the answer to this problem. Um, it's kind of cool because you can see that the height that this goes off the ground is totally irrelevant to its initial height off the ground or how, uh, how fast you're, you're throwing it. Um, you just need to know the total time of flight and you can find how high off the ground it went. I think that's a pretty cool fact. So uh, thank you guys for tuning in and have a nice day.